I study the vacuum. This probably sounds a little bit odd, right? Because you may think of the vacuum as empty space, nothingness. No atoms, no molecules. So what is there to study, especially for a particle physicist like me, who's interested in understanding the fundamental building blocks of matter, the way they interact, the way they form bound states, the protons and neutrons that make up atoms, that make up molecules, that make up you and me and the world around us. The vacuum is a lot more interesting in this respect than you may think, because it holds the answer to a key question that has been plaguing particle physicists for many decades. How do elementary particles like electrons acquire mass? The answer lies in the vacuum, which is in fact not empty. We discovered in 2012 that the vacuum is permeated by a field, the so-called Higgs field, that interacts with elementary particles, thereby giving them mass. It interacts more strongly with some than others. Electrons, for example, are relatively light because they only interact weakly with the Higgs field. Photons do not interact at all. They travel at the speed of light. They are massless. The discovery of the Higgs field and the associated particle, the Higgs boson, was a major scientific breakthrough. And the explanation for the mechanism that generates particle masses was awarded by Nobel Prize in Physics in 2013. This breakthrough would not have been possible without major technological and data science advancements. In order to study the vacuum, in order to study the smallest scales of nature, we need to build very powerful microscopes. And the, the microscopes that we particle physicists use are particle colliders. The idea behind particle colliders is fairly simple. You take particles, electrons, protons, it's really your choice. You accelerate them to very high energies and you smash them into each other. In these collisions, energy is turned into new particles. E equals mc squared. That's Einstein's famous equation right at work in our particle accelerators. The most powerful microscope in the world, and the only one that can see the Higgs field, is the Large Hadron Collider at the research center CERN close to Geneva in Switzerland. It's a 27-kilometer ring that is buried about 100 meters underground. It actually crosses the Franco-Swiss border, which you um, might be able to discern. So it's a really cross-border project. In this collider, two beams of protons are accelerated to very close to the speed of light, and they're brought to collision at four points along this ring, where large-scale particle detectors are located. These serve as cameras that record the, par the particles that are being created in these collisions. The two most powerful and biggest experiments in the LHC are the ATLAS and the CMS experiments. And the Helmholtz Center DZ is actually involved quite significantly in both of them. I myself work on the ATLAS experiment. The ATLAS detector is the largest of the LHC experiments. It's 44 meters long, the size of a small cathedral. The protons enter from two sides, they collide in the very center, and the particles emanate into the detector. The detector is made up of various layers of subdetectors that are arranged concentrically around the interaction point, like a big onion. The different detector layers are specialized to detect different kinds of particles and measure different properties. The innermost part, the very heart of the Atlas detector, for example, is a silicon pixel detector, a large CCD camera. The Atlas detector is one of the most complex scientific experiments ever built. You can see a person standing right in front of it. And you can imagine that this cannot be done by just a single institute. The ATLAS experiment and also the other LHC experiments are the results of large multinational corporations. In the case of the ATLAS detector, 3,000 scientists plus engineers and technicians work on this from 180 institutions from 38 countries. Germany is actually one of the biggest players here. We contribute about 10% in terms of budget and personnel, so we have quite an impact here. So these very complex detectors, as you will not be surprised to hear, generate immense amounts of data because we take very detailed pictures of these collisions. You can see here a particle collision recorded by the Atlas detector in 2012. The protons in the LHC are collided 40 million times per second. So in principle, we would want to take 40 million pictures per second. We need so many collisions because only very few of them produce interesting processes. For example, Higgs bosons. We on only have on average two Higgs bosons in these 40 million collisions. It's like you're looking for a needle in a haystack. The additional complication here is that we are only able to analyze about 1,000 collisions per second. And it's a huge challenge to filter out these 1,000 collisions out of these 40 million. We have a very elaborate filter system in place already inside the detector that can do this. And this system has to be very fast, 
300 milliseconds on average for a decision. And it has to be very efficient because we have to make sure that we don't miss any interesting processes when we select these 1,000 out of 40 million collisions. Even with these filter systems in place, the LHC experiments combined produce still between 50 and 70,000 terabytes of data per year. Your average laptop hard drive nowadays has about one terabyte of storage space. So you can't really store and process this data at a single computing center. We have, in fact, 170 computing centers in 42 countries that form the so-called LHC Worldwide Computing Grid. This computing grid provides round-the-clock worldwide access to particle physicists like me. So I can just take my laptop, go anywhere I have an internet connection. I can log on to the worldwide grid and send my piece of code that I want to use to analyze a particular property of, say, the Higgs boson. I can send this to wherever my data is stored, say, in Tokyo. The data is processed in Tokyo and is sent back to my laptop. That's very convenient, right? This sharing of, particle, of, of data across different countries is really at the heart of particle physics research nowadays. It sounds like a very modern concept, right, in the times of social media and the times of cloud computing, but in fact, this concept has been important for particle physics for many, many years. And in fact, the World Wide Web itself was invented at CERN in 1990 by a particle physicist who wanted to share data with his colleagues. So you can see how we go from trying to answer a fundamental question about nature, what is the origin of particle masses, to being driven to build large-scale accelerators, detectors, to really push the, the edge of what's technologically possible, to analyzing large amounts of data. And you see these efforts have paid off. We found a new field that we were not able to see before. Now, these developments are not isolated in particle physics. We naturally have a lot of overlap with other disciplines. Computer and data science, I guess, is an obvious one, but there are also many byproducts of particle physics that are being used in, for example, medical applications. Smaller scale medical accelerators, like this one in this picture in Heidelberg, can be used to treat certain types of cancer. So you can see there's a lot of flow of knowledge between particle physics and other fields. But where do we go from here? We know that the vacuum is not empty. We found a field which is very exciting for us. There's something new. And this field has helped us answer one question about nature. How do elementary particles acquire mass? Maybe it will help us answer another question, quite a big one. One of the biggest puzzles of particle physics nowadays is to explain the nature of the mysterious substance known as dark matter. Dark matter is thought to make up 85% of all matter in the universe. We know it exists because we have astrophysical observations, like this picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of a, ga a ga galactic cluster. We also have observations of galaxies. And by looking at the way that they move, we can determine that there must be an, an invisible substance that interacts gravitationally and shapes galaxies and clusters. We have no idea what the substance is. It doesn't really correspond to any of the known particles. And finding dark matter is really one of the big questions. It's something that we work on with many, many experiments, also within the Helmholtz Association. We actually just had a dark matter conference at DESI last week to discuss the state of the art of dark matter searches. And many people actually think that the Higgs field could have something to do with it. The Higgs boson could, in fact, be the only particle that directly interacts with dark matter. So by studying the vacuum more precisely, we may find this mysterious substance. The problem is that these processes could be extremely rare. We're talking about 100 to 1,000 times less abundant than the Higgs boson itself. So it's not like looking for a needle in a haystack, but it's looking for a needle in 1,000 haystacks. In order to do this, we need to analyze a lot more data. And the LHC is going to give us more data. We expect the LHC to run for another 20 years, and by the end of its lifetime, it will have provided about 1,000 times more data than we had when the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012. Getting more data is achieved by focusing the LHC beams a lot more, so you basically collide more protons per second. This is great in terms of giving us more data, but it's also a huge challenge for our detectors and for our data science infrastructure. Just to give you an idea, this is what a collision would have looked like in the innermost part of the Atlas detector, the one that I called a big CCD camera in 2012. This is what it will look like in 2026. We have about 10 times more particles. Our detector pictures are becoming a lot more complex. We need to reconstruct, identify, and measure each single one of these particles. 
And we already know that the computing resources, even with an expected growth until 2026, will not be sufficient to analyze detected pictures of this complexity. So we need to become smarter in what we do. We need to write better algorithms that can perform these analyses much faster. The essential realization here is that this is a pattern recognition problem, right? You need to identify many particles in a detector. It's like identifying many faces in a crowd. And we know that machine learning techniques are quite efficient at solving these pattern recognition problems. And we've started researching them. There's a lot of effort going into this. Just to give you one example, if we have many particles in our detector, it can be that they don't create seg separate signals. So you don't um, see the particles as separate particles in your detector, but you just have a single overlapping signal. And you need to be able to tell if that was created by several particles or just one. And we found that deep neural networks are actually quite efficient at doing this, because they can be trained to recognize these overlapping signals. And what is more, they're even faster, they're much faster than conventional algorithms, especially if you give them many, many particles to analyze. So that's quite a promising avenue to go down. These deep neural networks are already being used in our data analysis software, and we're looking into further improvements like running them on GPUs uh, using more complex deep neural networks. A particularly interesting avenue is that when you look at these problems more closely, you see that there are many similarities between the pattern recognition problems that we face in particle physics and problems that people face in other disciplines. In particle physics, for example, you may want to find the exact point where two protons collided in your detector, where all the particles are coming from. In medical research, you may want to identify the location of a tumor in a patient's brain, which is done by putting the patient in a PET scanner, you inject the patient with a substance that accumulates in the tumor, and it emits pairs of photons. And by looking at these camera pictures that are taken of these uh, pairs of photons, you can determine, using algorithms, to the exact position of the tumor in the patient's brain. People have written algorithms to do this, and there's been an effort to actually look if these algorithms can be adapted to run in particle detectors, with quite promising first results. I think this is a very intriguing thought, because we might have problems in different disciplines that look very different on the surface, but that have the same underlying pattern or data structure. So maybe by finding a solution to a problem in one field, we may be able to also solve another problem in a different field. Which is why I'm very excited to be here at this event, which brings together many people from different disciplines. I'm immensely looking forward to the discussions later in the coffee break. Thank you very much for your attention.